disabled people, especially institutionalization, incarceration, and policing. Lydia is currently a fall of 2016 visiting lecturer at Tufts University Experimental College, teaching disability theory, policy, and social movement. Most recently, Lydia was a Holly Law Fellow at the National LGBTQ Task Force. And Lydia. Um, I was thinking to myself a second ago that, oh, Sandy is saying my name. I don't have more time to screw around on Facebook. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. I will stop screwing around on Facebook and checking the Twitter feed for today's conference. Um, so, while I am in, this is not good, it's not just like this. Digging this up, which is fine. Um, <coughs> welcome. Some of you saw me at the front this morning, probably looking like I'm stressed out of my mind, which is true. I am stressed out, of, stressed out of my mind, which is probably partially because this is the first time we've done this, and I've been trying to help Sandy as much as I can, and partially because I am suffering through hell, otherwise known as law school, and I have finals in two weeks, which will not be fun or pleasant. Um, also, I think some of my students from Tufts are here. Is that true? Are you here? Am I making that up? Yay! Some of my students from Tufts are here. Um, I haven't graded your papers that were due a month ago yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I will. Um, and in case anyone is wondering, that is how you use PowerPoint on a Mac. Aha! Before we get started, um, and I only have about 40 or so minutes left to spend with you, I want to open with an invitation to use this space in the ways that feel comfortable to us. Uh, earlier you saw me running around for the thermostats because it was set to 80 in here. And with over 100 people in the room, that was terrible. So although my partner knows I like, to, I like it under 60 degrees, I, I set it to 70 in the hopes that although that's cooler than average, the fact that there's 100 people in here will make that a better temperature um, that we can live with. We spend a lot of our lives learning from a young age that there's only one correct way to show that we're being respectful or paying attention, particularly if we're in a formal situation like this one, where there's somebody presenting and you're expected to be learning something or gaining something from that person. And that if you are not sitting straight up with your feet on the floor looking directly at the presenter, then you are automatically being disrespectful or disruptive or non-compliant. I don't believe in that, so please feel free, as some of you already are, to move around the room, to sit on the floor, to come in and out. As Sandy already told you, there is a sensory break room that's on the other side of this floor where you can um, take a break too if you want a specific place that is quieter and away from the social commotion or from the content here. Um, and I say that because as a space full of disabled folks and folks working to practice allyship to our communities, the need to respect our bodies and to honor who we are and what we're experiencing is incredibly important. In fact, I would say that is central to the work that we're doing. Uh, I want to ask and invite you to join with me in taking a moment to get in touch with what our bodies are telling us. Just take a moment to ground ourselves in where our bodies are right now. What you're feeling, what your body is wanting or not wanting to do. You can close your eyes for this, but you don't need to. But I invite you to take this moment to ground yourself in your body. the next uh, amount of time that I've got with you, and I think we are now on a condensed schedule because of the technological issues, so I will try to be briefer. Um, 
I will be speaking about some issues of violence and abuse and potentially re-traumatizing or disturbing topics. And I don't know who all of you are. I know a bunch of you, but I don't know who all of you are. I don't know your experiences, your identities, who you are, your story, how you came to be here. And I want to make sure that everybody has a heads up before we dive into the materials so that this isn't, doesn't come as a surprise. Um, some of the things that we'll talk about will include violence at institutions, violence by police, and some mentions of sexual violence so that you know that now. If you feel the need to take a break, again, you can feel free to come in and out of this room. I will not feel upset or insulted um, if you do that. I will invite you to do what is best for you and your emotional and your bodily needs. So my slides are not going to display properly. I have just figured that out. That is wrong. None of this is working. That's great. Let's just leave it there because the rest of this is not displaying. I want to start by asking us to think about how we understand disability and why that's important. Today's summit is about the topic of intersectionality. And intersectionality, as you've heard some from Heather and as you've heard from Sandy, is a call to understand how systems of oppression not only can overlap, but can create new and pernicious forms of oppression. The term which was first coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, a black woman legal scholar uh, and a legal scholar and activist was first coined to describe what happens when race and gender, particularly if you are black and a woman, intersect with one another. In the time since Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term, intersectionality has come to be used as a theory, as a practice, and unfortunately as a buzzword for people who want to appear to be progressive but don't actually have any on the ground understanding of what intersectionality means. I've spent a lot of my time in spaces that are ostensibly committed to some kind of social justice or progressivism, to some kind of activism, whether that's around racial work or queerness work or disability work. And I will tell you that I often find myself the only person of color in a disability space, the only openly disabled person in a queer space, the only queer person who is talking about disability in a racial justice space. And that in, no matter where I am, I am constantly asked to sacrifice a piece of who I am for the sake of a movement that claims it's fighting for me, but in reality is cutting off pieces of me. How we understand disability and how we talk about disability falls into that. Oppression is not identical, and I will get onto that in a moment, but oppressions do follow patterns. Racism is not the same thing as ableism. Ableism is not the same thing as classism. Classism is not the same thing as anti-transness. They're not identical. But there are patterns to how oppression works. Patterns of power, patterns of disempowerment, patterns of erasure, patterns of invalidating experiences, and patterns of resources and scarcity benefiting those with the most political, economic, and social power at the direct expense of those who do not share in the same power. So when we talk about disability and the ways that we understand disability, we're also talking about patterns that we as members of many oppressed and marginalized groups can recognize. The inspiration porn pattern is not unique to disabled people, that we are inspirational or special just because we're disabled. We also hear that when we belong to another oppressed group. The same kind of thing. I hear it specifically, specifically as an East Asian in the, you must have been in America for a very long time. Your English is so good. How did you learn English? Um, I was raised here. It's my first language. I think that's how I learned it. <laughs> right? That the inspiration part. Wow, you managed to go all the way through college while, while becoming openly trans and talking about it on campus? That must have been so hard. You are so brave. We hear, we hear the same patterns across identity and experience. They're not identical, but they are patterns. They are patterns to how oppression works. The medicalization, the moralization, that who you are and how you exist in the world is a moral problem, that it is a moral failing, that who you are and how you exist in the world is a problem that doctors or psychiatrists need to fix. We hear these patterns across forms of oppression and across oppressed experiences. To understand how disabled people live in the world and the oppression that affects us, we have to talk about ableism. We have to name it. Ableism is an entire way of thinking and doing 
that harms disabled people. That means whether you actually consider yourself disabled, whether you lay claim to disability as an identity, or whether it is simply put upon you. It is assumed, it is perceived, it is categorized by the law. But if you are being perceived, categorized, or assumed to be disabled, then you will be affected by ableism. If somebody decides, oh, you can't possibly be a parent because you're in public with your child, and it's obvious that as a parent that you have a disability. If somebody presumes to you that the only reason, the only possible reason you don't have a college education is because of your disability, when in reality it could have been anything from lack of class privilege, being kicked out of school because you were trans, choosing not to go to college because what you wanted to do didn't require going to college and you had other options open to you. Any one of a million possible reasons or combinations of reasons, you didn't go. But the person will assume you didn't go because you were disabled. That must be the reason you didn't go. And it might be the case. It might be the case. But that interaction is an example of how ableism can affect you, whether or not you lay claim to this disability as your identity, whether or not disability is a salient part of your life. In other words, ableism is a form of oppression. It is a form of oppression that directly targets the body. That directly targets the body. I give an invocation and an invitation to ground ourselves in our bodily experiences because where I come from is a practice of disability justice. And disability justice is, at its core, a practice of honoring the body. Ableism is the form of oppression that cuts at whose bodies are considered valuable and worthy and desirable and whose bodies are not considered valuable and worthy and desirable. Oppression, to be clear, for those of you for whom this might be newer of a concept, refers to a social relations, a social power relations system, okay? I'm not talking about the 1984 totalitarian government or North Korea. I'm talking about how in societies it is shaped and it is perpetuated by giving certain groups of people, people who belong to that group or are assumed to belong to that group, social, political, economic power at the expense of people who either just definitively do not belong to that group or who definitively belong or are assumed to belong to another group. That is, if you, if you are considered to be a white person, a cisgender person, a heterosexual person, able-bodied, neurotypical, if you are considered to be those things in our society, the United States 2016, you experience power over those of us who don't. Oppression is complicated and messy, though. Oppression is complicated and, and messy. All forms of oppression are dependent on and necessary for every other form of oppression. This graph is not explained correctly. I apologize for that. That's what happens when I use a map. It doesn't work. All systems of oppression are necessary for and dependent on one another. You cannot have transmisogyny without ableism. You cannot have racism without ableism. And you also cannot have ableism without white supremacy. You cannot have ableism without classism. Systems of oppression depend upon each other to exist and to perpetuate. Ableism tells us which people's bodies, which people's bodies are not only normative, but healthy, beautiful, desirable, worthy of reproducing and of being reproduced, worthy of existing, which lives are worth living, which bodies are worth inhabiting. And so an understanding of ableism helps us understand how all other forms of oppression work and how they feed into one another. When bodies of East Asian women are treated as sexual objects to be used and abused, to be fetishized, to be treated as exotic, special, foreign, some new fantastic experience, or bodies to be used as commodities, as by US soldiers in the wars fought in the Asian Pacific Rim in the 20th century, that is a question of ableism. That is a question of ableism. Whose bodies are worthy of being treated as whole persons, as whole persons, and whose bodies are worthy of being discarded and, dis and disposed of? When we think along the history of, of the slavery, of, of chattel slavery of black people in the United States, if you ran away from slavery, you were said to have mental illness. 
If we look at the history of sexuality in the United States and in the Western world, if you were queer, if you engaged in sex work, this continues to be the case. If you do anything sexually that is considered non-normative, you were said to have a mental illness, to be neurotic, to be hysterical, to be mentally unwell, mentally unstable. If you are poor, you are said to be lazy, you are said to be stupid, unintelligent, incapable of higher thought. Because if you were smart, that is an ability word, if you were smart, you could have gone to college and made a name for yourself. This is how ableism operates. This is how ableism operates. It tells us which bodies are worth inhabiting and which bodies are not. It tells us that on the basis of being trans, or on the basis of being racialized, on the basis of being poor, that we are unworthy of life, that we are unworthy of sexual desire, that we are unworthy of gender self-determination, that we are unworthy of support and care, that we are unworthy of kinship or of love. To understand ableism and how it and how it plays out in the world, we need no we need to look no farther than the histories of our collective communities, communities which some of us belong to, some of us don't. I live at the intersection of a multitude of layers of privilege and layers of oppression. I live at that intersection. I experience bounds of privilege and power in the United States. And I experience bounds of oppression in the United States. And you can't separate that. You can't say that I fall in this category of just being the super privileged person or just being the super oppressed person because I don't. My existence blurs those lines. My existence blurs those, those lines. Being able to go to law school, being fluent in English, being a United States citizen, growing up with middle class financial access, those things give me immeasurable amounts of privilege. Being a trans, asexual, disabled person of color, East Asian, adopted into a transracial family, that means, that means that I exist at the brunt of multiple systems of oppression. And it's not just adding one plus one plus one, it's combining. And it's not just using privilege to subtract from oppression, minus one, minus one, minus one. It creates new and pernicious experiences. Many of you know about the existence of the Judge Rotenberg Center, south of Boston, which Mass Adapt joined with National Adapt the protest earlier this week. Over 200 folks, some of you here, were present for that. The Judge Rotenberg Center is the only institution in the United States that is known to use painful electric shock to change people's behavior. It's a form of punishment. They invented their own device designed to be more powerful and painful than a police taser. For years, since it opened in 1971, Disabled advocates and non-disabled people trying to practice allyship have campaigned against the JRC to have it closed. But by and large, the vast majority of the people who understand the racial implications of the JRC are those of us who are disabled people of color. 85% of all people at the JRC are black or Latinx. 90% all people of color combined. But this story is missing. You see, the stories that we tell and the ways in which we tell them reveal quite a lot to us about whose bodies and whose minds we consider valuable and worthy and desirable, and whose we do not. Many of you heard over the summer the story of Arnaldo Rio Soto and Charles Kinsey. Arnaldo being a Latinx autistic person living in a group home, and Charles Kinsey a black man working as a behavioral aide in the group home. They were out in public in the neighborhood. Arnaldo had left the group home. They called it, they called it eloping as he had done many times before. Of course, this is not questioned in the narrative. He was eloping, and so of course he had to be returned to the group home where he belonged, safely shut away from the rest of society. Charles Kinsey went looking for him, found him in the street. Arnaldo was holding a green toy truck. Police were called on the two of them. Others will claim, we don't know why. We know why. We know exactly why the police were called, seeing a Latinx man and a black man in public. That's why the police were called. When they approached, and this is caught on film, Charles Kinsey is lying on the ground with his hands clearly in the air, while Arnaldo is sitting beside him, holding the toy truck in his hand. And Charles is simultaneously begging Arnaldo to lie down on the ground and begging for the police to not shoot them. The officer shoots Charles Kinsey. And Charles asks the officer, he fortunately is not dead, 
he asked the officer, sir, why did you shoot me? And the officer's response was, I don't know. In the days following the shooting, in the days following the shooting, the police agency, the police agency decided to issue a, a claim statement saying, we weren't actually trying to shoot the black guy with his hands in the air. We were trying to shoot the autistic guy because he was dangerous and threatening the black guy. We were trying to protect the black guy. That, that's what we were doing. And the initial backlash, the initial backlash throughout disability communities, the statement was, oh, how dare you say that you were going to shoot an autistic person? That is the worst thing imaginable. General folk, autistic and other disabled people are murdered constantly by police and institutions and by our own family members. But the horror of most disability advocates to this, not us, I hope, was how dare you say you would shoot an autistic person? That's the horrible thing. Oh, so shooting a black person with their hands in the air is apparently not horrible, but shooting someone that's autistic, we're just gonna say autistic, is somehow the worst thing ever and unthinkable because we're innocent angels untouched by violence? is an insult to our experience, is an insult to the collective and individual trauma of virtually every autistic person that I know. Arnaldo wasn't any random autistic person. He is a Latinx autistic person. He is a Latinx person. There is layer upon layer of racism and ableism, both in what actually happened to Charles and to Arnaldo, and to how it's been talked about, understood, and responded to since it has happened. Here's the rest of the story. Arnaldo has been institutionalized. He is living in an institution in Florida where just a few days ago, another resident was killed. Just a few days ago. He's living in an institution because the state claims, oh, his needs are so severe now that he clearly has trauma. From what, you wonder? That now he has trauma that we can't take care of him in the community. There's no possible other place for him to go. Let me tell you another story. Some of you in the room, many of you probably don't, know about what happened to Neely Latson. Neely Latson was also a black autistic young man who in February 2010, at only 18 years old, was sitting outside of his local library waiting for it to open so he could go inside. The someone drove by, saw a black person sitting out the library and said, oh, yep, definitely suspicious, clearly a criminal called the police and said, this is a suspicious guy out here. Maybe he has a gun or something. So the police were called on Neely Latson. They came, they approached him, they confronted him. He panicked and tried to walk away. This led to an altercation. There was a fight. He was beaten, he was tased, he was charged with assaulting the police officer. He was initially sentenced to 10 and a half years in prison. He served several, most of it in solitary confinement. And at the beginning of 2015, at the beginning of 2015, after it took years for the majority of disabled-run organizations to consider putting out any statement about Neely Latson, the governor issued a conditional pardon, and most of disability land rejoiced and celebrated, great, he's been pardoned, he's leaving prison, he never belonged in prison anyway. But the insidious argument underlying his entire time in the carceral system was he doesn't belong in prison, he needs treatment. Neely Latson is living in the same institution where Arnaldo Rio Soto is. The girl who was murdered there is named Janaya Barnhart. She's a black disabled girl. This institution run by a company for profit called Adversar is killing our people. In multiple states, investigations have been launched against this, this for profit company in multiple states, and the findings have been substantiated. They continue to operate. They continue to operate with no restrictions. Where is our advocacy on this? This is not, this is not me saying, you're not doing something. This is me asking, as a community, as a community, where is this on our radar? Where is this on our radar? This is how ableism operates. It doesn't operate without other oppression. It depends on other oppression to exist. It depends on other oppression to exist. The Supreme Court case of 1927 in Buck v. Bell, which found that it was not only not a constitutional right to violation to forcibly sterilize a young person said to have intellectual disabilities, but in fact, in the interest of the greater good, in the public interest, has never been overturned. In the time since that decision, 
untold tens of thousands of people that are disabled, that are indigenous, that are Latinx, that are black, have been forcibly in have been forcibly sterilized everywhere from California to the eastern to the eastern coast. And we don't know about the majority of these people. We don't. We do not know about the majority. This is what ableism looks like when it is contextualized, compounded, and reshaped into new forms of oppression by other systems of structural oppression. As a queer person and as a trans person, I've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years coming slowly, fumbling into queer and trans and asexual spaces, spaces where I still feel like I don't really belong. Not just because I'm out as disabled, but because I've gone through a long struggle to be able to lay claim to my identity as a queer person, as a trans person, someone who's genderqueer, blurring the boundaries between what our society assumes are genders that are acceptable, that actually exist. And it's a been a long journey for me in part because we, as any marginalized or oppressed people, are constantly told, are told that we are not the experts or authorities on our own bodies or experiences. That we are unable to make self-determination for ourselves or that we are unable to understand who we are. And so in queer and trans communities, we've had a long history of fighting against the pathologization of who we are. The saying that being trans is a mental illness or being queer is a mental illness by saying, well, being queer or trans is not a mental illness. There's nothing wrong with us. What's in that statement is that there is something wrong with those people over there. That we don't fall into this category of mental illness, but there is a category. We're just not in it. But the people who are in it, they should be subject to criminalization. They They should be subject to invalidation. They should be subject to medical surveillance and to control. They are unreliable if they report sexual survivorship. They are unreliable and unstable and scary and threatening if we allow them into our community and our space, but not us. Don't lump us in with them. And we do this to each other. Autistic folks in my own community are constantly saying, yes, I'm autistic, but that's not a mental illness. Sure, I'm autistic, but at least I don't have retardation. Accept me for who I am. I've heard it from activists that are physically disabled, but neurotypical, telling me, or in my presence, yeah, I have a physical disability, but there's nothing wrong with my brain. Everything's all right up here. And what are we doing but telling one another that we are only able to lay claim to our own humanity at the expense of someone else? All we've done, all we've done is engaged in the art and practice of disavowal. We have learned that we may only lay claim to our own humanity by doing so at the expense of somebody else. That is my history as an East Asian. That is what East Asian America is in the history of US white supremacy. We are used as a wedge between whiteness, blackness, brownness, and indigeneity. We are told that we only get to be accepted as people, as equals, these neoliberal ideas, equality, freedom, political rights. You are a model minority, what does that mean? It means that we have become close to assimilating into whiteness. Close, but not exactly, because we still look a little too odd to be exactly considered white. But we're close enough, because we're light enough. And that if we buy into that, we can be afforded the illusion of equality. But we can only do that at the expense of our community comrades, who are black or brown or, or indigenous. That is what we are told. That is my history, the history that I bear on my shoulders. And so my invocation And those of you who've heard me speak before, you know a bit about this. My invocation to us is that we have to recognize and fight against the pathology paradigm that tells us there's only one normal way to be human and that anyone who deviates from this imagined normal must be fixed, controlled, or stamped out. This is the paradigm that embeds ableism into a violent force. This is the paradigm that leads to the rates of over 90% of sexual assault survivorship of people considered women with developmental disabilities. This is the violence that means that 60 to 80% of all people killed by police are deaf or disabled, which means the target demographic are black folks who are deaf or disabled. Where is this intersectionality? Where is this intersectionality? That in institutions, if you are psychiatrically hospitalized, More often, if you're white, you'll be considered the good kind of mentally ill. And if you are not, if you are racialized, if you are darker, if you are black or Latinx, if you are indigenous, you will be considered the bad kind of mentally ill and placed under greater restriction and greater surveillance in the institution. 
that if you are considered acceptable, you might get the invitation. But if not, you'll be shoved out. And so this is a call to us to bring everybody in. Everyone can't be in this place right now, but we can change that. We can knock down these walls instead of just moving the fence a few inches over. We can bring everybody in. We can take down the pathology paradigm. And we can seek to practice disability justice as an intersectional imperative, not some buzzword, but as how we ought to live our lives and do our activism. We don't inhabit single issue lives. We don't have single issue communities. Thank you for being here. Playing. I had all these beautiful diagrams. They're not displaying on a Mac. That's not displaying either. Thank you, Lydia. In the interest of time, we probably will be able to take at most two questions. But I also would like to note that in the email that you probably should have gotten, one of the hundreds for me. Each presenter who had a Twitter handle, their Twitter handle had been made available, and feel free to tweet your questions to that as well. Mine is on the slide. It's at autistic, A-U-T-I-S-T-I-C, Hoya, H-O-Y-A. That's A-U-T-I-S-T-I-C, H-O-Y-A. Uh, because we would like to have this far beyond after this event, so that's also why I intentionally made the Twitter handles available to everyone. So, and with that said, any questions for now? I see several hands. There's uh, one hand, one hand, and one hand. I have another hand. I'll just stand up and speak loud. You have to use the microphone. Okay. Access issue. All right. So, great, great talk. Um, where would you place personal growth? Some of what you talked about, sort of the convergence of the societal issues you so well presented. And then I was thinking of Heather's presentation earlier about how she had to accept certain things. Especially the way when where people, you know, will segment themselves, right, and end up being part of the oppression. Where would you put personal growth in that? So the question is, where would you put personal growth? Going off with Heather's presentation, talking about her journey of self-discovery and personal growth, you've talked about these societal issues and societal change, but where would you talk about personal growth, especially where people segment themselves? That is the question, correct? So what my my if I understand you correctly, you're asking about as an imperative, right? And so what I would say is we are all learning and growing all the time. Nobody is perfect. So I spent a lot of time in activism spaces where there's unspoken uh, assumption that everyone has to have perfect politics, perfect analysis, know all the new buzzwords, etc. And that's classist and ableist as fuck. That is not good or responsible activism. Sometimes I use buzzwords because those buzzwords are things that if I learned them, they made sense to me. But I don't use them because I expect everybody else to use them. Or that if you don't use, if you don't use the word structural oppression, I can never talk to you. You can never speak to me. You can't be in my presence. That's not how I understand the language that I use. And so when I say we're all learning and growing, I mean that literally. Nobody is perfect. That means we can allow ourselves to make mistakes, and it means we can recognize that the people around us are not some shining paragons of. I will never be as good as that person speaking, that activist over there, that advocate, etc. And what that means on a practical level is self-education and cooperative education. There's a slide on there that probably also does not display correctly, so I won't go hunting for it, about the concept of interdependence. Interdependence as meaning rejecting the ableist and capitalist myth that somehow we all have to do things on our own. And if you can't do it on your own, then you're a failure. You're not trying hard enough. Because what that does is it leads people to die. I mean that quite literally. So if we understand education as being both self-education and being interdependent education, that means we're responsible for ourselves. 
but it also means we're responsible for one another, for one another, let me put a caveat on that. I don't mean that you are responsible for taking care of literally everybody. That burden is often put on the backs of the most oppressed people. What I mean is that the people you choose to be in close community with, the people you choose to be in close community with, you are taking on some level of responsibility, dependent on your spoons, dependent on the course of your lives and where you're going, to help one another. We can't go it alone. We can't expect everybody to be able to find everything because self-education is important, but it also depends on privilege, like the money to pay for internet, the education to know how to use the internet, literacy, education that you've had, formal or informal, to understand what you're reading or what you're watching on a video, to understand the signs that someone is using to describe intersectionality, right? And so self-education is important, but we can't expect that everybody can actually self-educate on everything either. And so to learn and grow simply means, as I understand it, oppression is violence, right? Oppression is violence. And so if we care about ending oppression, that means we care about ending violence in our own lives, interpersonally, just as much on the broad, as on the broader social level. That means how can I, in my life, support the people in my life, whether or not they're invested in activist <coughs> politics, whether or not they know or use social justice language, but because they're human beings. This is a trans person who's never been to a trans activist space. That doesn't matter if the trans person is being shut out of their apartment, that they've never been in an activist space. Here's a disabled person who's been fired from their job and is now homeless. It doesn't matter if this disabled person has never shown up in an ADAPT meeting, never been to one of these conferences, doesn't know the word ableism, they're a disabled person who's being kicked out because of ableism. And that matters in our society. So personal growth for me is an imperative to do better, to be decent people, and to fight against violence in whatever ways we can. I hope that helps answer your question. There was a hand over there, there's a hand over there. Um, I don't know if there's hands all the way to the right because I can't see all the way to my right, clearly. Yeah, the one in the front here. Mea culpa, I, I, I disclaim any liability, express or implied, from, <laughs> from the questions. Hi, uh, is this on? Uh, so first of all, is the sensory room the same as the quiet room? So the question was, is the sensory room the same as the quiet room? The answer is yes. I right. didn't use the phrase quiet room right. because it's often used in institutions. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, as somebody who was locked into a quiet room for months on end as a teenager for being considered the uh, DSM diagnosis of homosexual, thank you. Thank you for not using that word. Uh, I find that word ex extremely um, upsetting. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and then uh, thank you too for your comments. Very, very nice. I uh, had a little difficulty following you because you speak very rapidly. Um, but uh, I have to say that what I did understand of what you said was terrific. And what I also wanted to say that the commonality of oppressions that you pointed out at the end of your talk of, you know, the oppressed group uh, Looksism, for example, the pretty one thinks that somebody else is ugly, the, the racial thing, the light-skinned person is privileged over the ba uh, black-skinned person, the um, ableism, the you know, physical disability is privileged over the mental disability, etc. Those are all things that we, barriers that we're starting to break down. And I have to tell you that this is the, I'm almost 70, this is the most exciting thing that I've seen since the civil rights movement. You know, as I languished in that secluded, the seclusion room, not solitary confinement, the quiet room, uh, my white Southern father marched across the bridge at Selma, Alabama uh, with Mo uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And many, many years ago, I did not know that he did not care that I was in the place that I was in. Okay, so we have many, many, many barriers to overcome, but this is, this is truly, truly transformative and exciting, this stuff, especially 
as we go into this election season, uh, 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 election uh, coming forward, that's you know just trash. It's just trash. We need to build something totally new. So thank you. And the comment for the and I love your blog too. Thank you. The comment for those who are listening, and I apologize if I don't get all of that. Was first, a thank you for calling the room a sensory room and not a quiet room. The commenter said that they had been locked up in what was called the quiet room because they were homosexual. And then they said the second thing was that they thought this presentation or this event is the best thing that they've been to. They are almost 70 years old because they are understanding now the connection of different kinds of oppression, of, uh, of light skin versus dark skin, so colorism, of racism, um, and that it is the most exciting thing they've seen since the Civil Rights Movement, that their white son and father marched in Selma across the bridge with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but didn't care that the commenter was locked up in the seclusion room, and that they think this is terrific, and also they like my blog. <laughs>